You have no right to be ordinary. God has called you to be extraordinary.
with us. Sing it to the Father today.
worshiping with us this morning, if you would turn your attention to the screens. You want to be important? Wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. By giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. That servant. And so that video is an image of what we did this last Monday, the MLK Day of Service. We had over 100 students that you were out there making a difference in our community, 10 different organizations, and we want to thank you for those who serve. But we also want to remind you that coming up in April, we're going to have a day called Serve Lynchburg, where we're going to take thousands of us and go out in our community to make a difference here, to show the light of Jesus into this community, to let them know who God is and what God has done. Hey, I want to lead us in a brief prayer this morning, and then I'm going to have Coach Freeze come up, who is going to introduce our speaker for today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who gave his all so that we could have it all. God, we thank you that he died, that he rose again. And Lord, I pray now, as we have walked through this time of worship this morning, as we have been ushered into your presence today, I pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to what you want us to hear. God, I pray that you would change what needs to be changed and direct us where we need to be directed. And God, that you would speak truth into our lives today because we so desperately need it in the world in which we live. God, we thank you for all that you're going to do in this moment together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, I want to introduce to you, I don't really need to introduce you to him, you know him, Coach Hugh Freeze, who is going to come up and introduce his friend who is going to be speaking to us today. So let's welcome Coach Freeze. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, man, guys, listen. There was a song that was sung earlier that talked about uh, how God would carry us through any time. And that is absolutely true. I'm I'm a testimony to that. And one of the ways he does that, I believe, is by bringing people into your lives that, uh, that model what Jesus is like. And the highest compliment I can give this guy is he has been that to me in every area of my life, in the great times, the mountaintops, the valleys, and everywhere in between. He has uh, been the most consistent mentor uh, for me over the past seven to ten years and uh it's just an incredible honor you're in for an incredible treat today he's one of the best speakers and teachers i know please welcome my good friend chip henderson (laughs) appreciate it bro love you man what's up liberty convo how are you guys doing Man, good to see you guys today. Hey, shout out my son. Reagan is a student here, freshman at Liberty. So, man, we're home. Him and his boys are over here today. Hey, what's the, what's the greatest uh, invitation you've ever received? What's the best invitation you've ever received? Maybe you've been in, invited to attend an exclusive event. Maybe you got to go to a Super Bowl. Maybe you were invited to spend a, a few weeks in the Hamptons in the summertime. Maybe you were invited to, to be in a prestigious internship this coming summer, and that's amazing. Maybe you had the opportunity to play golf at Augusta National. That is very rare. Some of you guys are overachievers. You were inducted into the Hall of Fame in your high school. Wow, way to go. That's awesome. For the rest of you, your best, your best kind of uh, invitation has been to go to Taco Bell or, you know, Waffle House with some friends. Shout out to all the normal people here, right? Nothing wrong with that. Amazing, amazing invitations that maybe you've had. Maybe you've even had the privilege of having someone that you love fall down on a knee 
open up a box with a ring in it and say, I want you to be with me forever. That's an amazing invitation. It really is. But as awesome as all those invitations are, listen, there is one invitation that far exceeds all others. And that is this invitation. Jesus invites you to follow him. Now, please hear me. He doesn't invite you simply to believe in him. He doesn't invite you to go to church, be a better person, or invite him into your world to make your world better. He invites you to follow him, to get behind him, to walk his road. It means that you would conform fully and wholly to his example. It means that of all the ways that you could live your life, of all the things that you could chase after and go after, you choose to side with him, to surrender to him in every way. Now, in the scripture, in in Luke's Gospels, chapter 3, 4, and 5, I was spending some time there over the the, the summer, and God's just been been showing me this invitation that's above all other invitations, and I want to share this call with you today, this invitation with you. Jesus invites you to follow him in some specific ways. First, he invites you to follow him in getting your identity and your validation from God the Father. Where do you get your validation? Where do you get your identity and your sense of significance? Nothing wrong with wanting and needing those things. God put that within us. We come from our wombs and mama, look at me. Mama, mama, mama. Y'all ever got that? You got a younger brother or sister? Look at me, look at me, look at me. We're born with that. It's innate. We want to find validity, significance, to have identity. Even as a growing adult, you want to hear, good job, don't you? Well done. I appreciate you. I see you. You're amazing. You're getting a raise. Come on. Anybody want to get a raise, right? We want somebody to acknowledge I'm doing a good job. But you can be tempted, please hear me, you can be tempted to get your identity and your validation in wrong things. You can be tempted to try to find your identity and validity in your performance or your achievement as if what you do or what you accomplish makes you important or not. You can be tempted to get it from your appearance as if your validation's coming from the mirror in the gym. Come on, fellas, where y'all at? Y'all know that's the most used piece of equipment in the gym is the mirror. Everybody's looking at them guns, want to know how I'm looking. And you can try to get your validation from Lululemon or Gucci or Drew or whatever it is as if wearing those clothes makes me somebody. You can try to get your validation from your relationship status, your educational excellence, your wealth or social standing, the number of followers you have on social media media, the size of your platform, all those things may feel like that makes you somebody or the lack of them can keep you from feeling like you matter at all. But I want to declare over you, you are not your failure. You're not your lack. Jesus got his identity. He received his validation from one source and that was from God the Father. Luke chapter 3 verse 21 reads, now when all the people who were, were baptized, Jesus was also baptized and while he was praying, Heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Do you see it? Jesus is receiving his validation in this moment from God the Father. I love you and I'm pleased with you and I accept you. Jesus is receiving acceptance. You're my son. Now, when did Jesus know he was God's son? When did he know he's going to be God in the flesh? I don't know. I've been asked that. I don't know. I don't know if Jesus was like in the womb and he already knew, like he's just in there hanging out for nine months, you know, waiting to be born. He's God. I don't know if he was punking Mary saying, you know, let there be light and her belly light up. I don't know if he was doing that. I doubt it. I don't know if his mama told him, hey, you're really God's son. I don't know if he learned it in synagogue school. I don't know if he was reading the Bible one day and it dawned on him, the Holy Spirit enlightened him. But right here, the father says, you are my son. This is who you are. This is your identity. Now, listen. Regardless of what Jesus was going to encounter and experience, no matter the rejection, the false accusation, the hate, or the injustice, God the Father said, you belong to me. And I love you. You're my beloved son, a declaration of affection. Jesus could love so amazingly because he was loved so completely by the Father. He gave love because he had love. You just sang a song about the love of God. When you receive the love of God, that changes everything. You now have love to give, and Jesus is received and approved by God. I'm well pleased in you. 
God verbally says to him, I'm pleased in you. He doesn't say I'm pleased with you as if you did something to make me like you more. He says, I am pleased in who you are. Now, why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you say that I have turned from my sin and myself, and by God's grace through faith, I'm accepting Jesus as my Savior, God the Father makes that exact same declaration over you. You are now accepted. You belong to God. You don't get your approval from other places. Your identity is you're a son or a daughter of God. You're a spiritual son or daughter. That's your standing, no matter what anybody else says about you, no matter what your life experiences bring. You're not defined by your worst failure, somebody. You blew it. The voices haunt you. Condemnation. Somebody's voice from your childhood. But would you hear Jesus speak a better word over you today? You're not a loser. You're not a fool. You're not stupid. You're not a miserable sinner. You're not a pervert. You're not a crook. You're not a slut. You're not a whore. You are not defined by that. You are defined by what Jesus says about you, what God says about you. You are a son or a daughter. Please hear me. You're not, a, you're not defined by your greatest achievement. You may be successful and bright and powerful and popular, but that does not make you who you are. You are a child of God, a spiritual son or daughter, accepted. You belong. You're in because God says so. And you're loved. God loves you. Please hear me. His disposition toward you right now is love. God's not mad at you. Please hear me. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed. He's not frustrated. He's not put out with you. And if you were raised in a religious background, you can feel all those things because of the rules and of religion. And you feel like God's perpetually disappointed. And he's not. He loves you. The first song you learned to sing when you were a little kid was, Jesus loves me. Not Jesus wants me to keep the rules. Jesus loves me. The first Bible verse you probably learned was, for God so Love the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's now the love of God, Paul says, that constrains us. God didn't want you to be constrained by the rules of God or the expectations of God or of yourself or other people. God loves you and it's a perfect love. He cannot love you more or less than he does right now. And it's an unconditional love. You can never, ever lose that love. And you're approved by God. He's pleased in you. You don't perform so that God will like you more. He doesn't say, I'm pleased with you. He says, I'm pleased in you because of what Jesus has already done. You're a child of God, loved by God. You don't live for approval. You live from approval. No matter, no matter how you do, God is pleased with you. I think about it like this. I think I brought a picture of some children's art, child's art. Maybe y'all have seen child's art. Y'all put that on the screen somewhere. Um, or maybe you can't. Think about a kid's art. All right, it's not gonna, it's not gonna come up apparently. Uh, there it is. All right, there's, there's kid's art. Okay, what the heck is that? <laughs> Who knows? But this little kid brings that picture to mama and, and, and dad, and they're like, oh my gosh, you're an artist. You're, you're Da Vinci, you're, 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 you're a Picasso, you're somebody who can just paint and, and create and whatever. It is amazing what you've done. Now, is that a good picture? No, that picture sucks. That is an awful picture. What's mom or dad saying? They're not saying, I'm pleased with you. You're so amazing. They're saying, I'm pleased in you. You're my child, and I don't care what the effort looked like. You try. I'm pleased in you. You get it? You feel me? Because our lives sometimes look like that. Our lives are sometimes that jacked up, that messy, that ugly. And yet God says, I'm pleased in you, not because of your work, but because of what my son Jesus has done. Here's why that's a big deal. This affirmation is what launched Jesus into his public ministry. It was the foundation of everything he did, everything he lived, everything he loved, everything he served, everybody he ministered to was from this affirmation of who he was. He was loved and approved by God. He didn't strive for it. He simply rested in it. And can I say to you, uh, Liberty Convo, some world changers up in here potentially, and no doubt, but you need to be set free from living for approval and for acceptance and for somebody else's love. And you today need to rest in the identity and validation of God the Father who says to you, I love you, I accept you, I approve of you right now because of my son Jesus. And let that affirmation free you then to go pursue the things of God and stand in truth of who you are. You don't need it, you got it. Y'all with me? But listen, this is important because this affirmation is what sustained Jesus in the hardest times of his life. 
Jesus got this affirmation from God the Father two times. Once at his baptism, we're looking at the second time was at the mountain of transfiguration. The beginning of kind of the end of Jesus' life. From the mountain of transfiguration on, he's turning his attention toward Jerusalem. He is headed toward now rejection and betrayal and being denied and having the sins of the world heaped upon him. Listen, life for Jesus was about to become unfair. Life for Jesus was about to include mistreatment. He's going to be done wrong. He's going to feel pain. The darkness of the world is going to envelop his life. So before he walks this road, the Father again affirms him so that when the circumstances of life clouded his mind and the enemy accused and lied and tempted, the Father wanted Jesus, the Son, to be locked down and sustained in this. I accept you. You belong to me. I love you. Nothing will ever change that. I'm pleased in you regardless of how you feel. This became the anchor for Christ to endure the storm and the onslaught of hell and its devil, and it carried him through. And I'm saying to you, you may be in the middle of hell right now. You may be going through it right now. Maybe it's your fault, somebody else's fault, but you're in the middle of it, and Jesus wants you to anchor today. He wants this to carry you into your future, that you are loved and accepted and approved by God based on Christ, not based on you. I remember being right out of college in seminary, Pursuing a calling of God, of ministry on my life. But guys, can I just tell y'all, man, I had a, I, I was a mess. Salvation is a miracle of a moment, but sanctification is a journey of a lifetime. And there was still so much duplicity and inconsistency in my life. And after one moment where I had failed spectacularly, I remember sitting on a bench at, at seminary and I'm just crying my eyes out saying, God, I'll never get this. I'll never be good enough. I can't do this. And God reminded me of a song that we sang when I was a little kid that just said, Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, his hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, God, unto me. And God just spoke to me, Chip, it's not about what you did, it's what I've done. Chip, it's not about what you say or anybody else says, it's what I've said about you. And listen, that anchored me in the midst. And so I'm just saying to you, would you anchor today? Get your identity, your validity, your significance comes from God the Father. Would you follow Jesus in that? Would you, secondly, would you, would you follow Jesus in this, in this invitation to live filled and led and empowered by the Holy Spirit every day? You're not just a child of God. Listen, you're now a warrior. You're sent as light into a dark world. Not to live in the flesh and by the flesh. You're called to live filled with, led by, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, right after his baptism, Luke 4, 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come on, and now he's full of the Holy Spirit. He returns from the Jordan, and he was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Do you see it? He's full of the Spirit. It's not Jesus doing the Jesus thing. It's Jesus doing whatever the Spirit says do. Led by the Spirit. Like playing follow the leader, or Simon says, Jesus would say, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. He's following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says about you, Romans 8, 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, those are really the sons of God. God didn't ask you to invite him into your life and then you take over and run the thing. No, he's saying you be filled with me, led by me, and that leads into an empowering, a supernatural enabling. Luke 4, 14, when Jesus returns from the desert after being tempted in obedience, it says Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. That Jesus, listen, the secret to his life as a man or a a person like you was not that he was God from the womb and he's just calling out miracles because he's God. He's living like us. The key to Jesus' life, the key to everything that he did, the reason there was power in his life and through his life is because he lived filled with and led by and then there was a supernatural enabling by the Holy Spirit to see miracles. That's the invitation to you today, not to be a preacher or a missionary in your own strength, not to own your own business or go set the world on fire as a movie star or whatever. That ain't it. It's an invitation to live your life surrendered to, filled with, led by the Holy Spirit so that his divine empowerment might flow through you. Now, the world's going to fight against that. Your flesh is going to fight against that. The devil's going to fight against that. Jesus experienced that. If you go back and read Luke chapter 4, he goes into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading his life, and the devil unleashes hell on him to try to get him to quit. And he's tempted three different times, and and, and not just those three times, but even past that. And can I say that the scripture 
It says in Luke 4, uh, verse 13, that the devil left him until an opportune time. And can I just say to you, Liberty student, that the enemy is not happy with the activity of God in your life. He don't mind you coming up in here and getting your worship on. He just don't want you to leave this place and let Jesus take over. And he's going to tempt you when you're vulnerable, when you're weak, when you're alone, when you feel discouraged or depressed or when you feel like you need love. He's coming at you, and it'll be very, very subtle. He's not going to come at you and say, hey, man, how would you like to rot your soul and, and, and destroy your, your life? He's not going to do that. Temptation's going to look reasonable. It's going to sound like it's a good idea. It's going to make good sense, and it's always going to be deadly. But here's what I want you to hear from the story of Jesus. That temptation is not for you just to go do something bad. It's a temptation for you to walk away from God's design and provision for you to live in the Spirit, by the Spirit, with a supernatural empowering and enablement on your life. Please hear me. The temptation is not to go have sex with your girlfriend or boyfriend. It's not to go steal money from somebody that it doesn't belong to you. That, that's bad stuff. But those are not the issue. What the enemy wants you to do is to walk away from God's best. So he says to Jesus, if you're really the son of God, use your power to turn the stones into bread. Satisfy your own flesh. If you're really God's son, hey man, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. What's wrong with that? That's what Jesus came to do. Right goal, wrong way. And listen, if you being success, successful in the world causes you to dishonor God, God would rather you be a failure in the eyes of the world and honor him. Jesus says, I'm not doing it. Jump off the temple, man. You would have people for days. People would come to you, Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus wants the world to come to him. But Jesus says, that is not the way either. Those are temptations. But listen, they were all geared to get Jesus to live in his flesh, by his flesh, for his flesh, rather than in the spirit, by the spirit, for the glory of God. Now, here's, where that make, here's what I want you to hear. Everything the enemy offered him illegitimately because he chose to honor God, filled, led, he was empowered by the Spirit, God gave him in spades, turned the stones into bread. Hey, listen, because he honored God, he could say to his disciples, I got meat to eat you don't even know about. He could multiply fishes and loaves and feed thousands of people because he's honoring God. There's a supernatural empowerment to his life. You with me? Because he says, hey, bow down and worship me and I'll give you the world. Jesus said, no, I think I'll honor God and get the world and take your job too. How about that? He takes the enemy's power and authority because he's honoring the God, the Father. Hey, jump off the temple, man. You'll have people follow you for days. Jesus said, I live for an audience of one. I think I'll just honor him. And because he honored him, read the Gospel of Luke and see the theme of the crowds. Crowds, crowds follow Jesus. Why? Because he didn't try to win a crowd and build a platform. He just wanted to honor the Father. And everything that you need, everything you need, everything God has for you is going to be found in you saying to Jesus, I want to follow you. I don't want to just believe in you and be a good person. I want you to fill my life and lead me every single moment of my life so that your kingdom comes through my life. Everything the enemy tempted him, tempted him with, God the Father blessed him with that and then some. And that's really the call of God on your life and mine. Is it possible for you to actually experience supernatural encounters, supernatural results, if you just start saying, God, what are you doing? I'm listening. Show me. Help me. Christy, my wife, and I were on our way back from being out of the country on a mission trip back in the fall, and we were in Atlanta trying to get home, and we had been delayed, and we were not going to make our last flight to Mississippi, and so uh, my flesh, uh, look, being real, my flesh is, look, I'm going home. I'll go rent a car, I'll drive the five, six hours from Atlanta back to Mississippi, and, and I may beat the airplane by two hours, but I won. Uh, anybody else in here like that? I mean, I, I got home. And so I'm thinking, that's what I'm going to do. But somehow God was just speaking into us, no, just chill, just trust me, stay the night. So we're standing in the line waiting with the, you know, the red coats to give us the help to, to hear what they're going to tell us about where we're going to stay. And there's a girl in front of us. She's got a military backpack on, real, real short haircut, and she is giving the manager, the person behind the desk, an earful. They're not cooperating. She ain't getting her way, and she is causing a scene. Y'all ever seen that kind of thing happen? I mean, she is throwing down. And so she goes off, and we step up, and they give us our little voucher to go get a hotel room for the night. And we're about to leave and go down the escalator, get on the plane train, and we look over there, and this little girl is 20-something years old. She's crying, sitting on the floor. And I know what she's going to have. She's going to have to spend a night in the airport. 
And Christy and I are talking, do we do anything? You know, and we just felt like God's telling us, go engage this girl. So we go over there, she's on the phone, she hangs up the phone, and we just said, hey, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm not okay. I'm a single mom. I've been down in Louisiana. We've been doing disaster relief in my military unit. I'm trying to get home to Ohio. I've got emotional and mental health issues, and I've been triggered. And y'all don't know this about us, but my wife has battled with mental and emotional health issues for a long, long time. By God's grace, she's having victory over that. But when this little girl says, I, I've got mental and emotional health issues, man, we know right now this is a God moment. And so we say to her, look, this may sound crazy, but we've got a voucher. We're about to go get a hotel room. We're going to catch an Uber and go, get, go, go stay. Would you want to get in the Uber with us, and we'll, we'll get you a hotel room tonight. We'll pay for you to have a room too. And she said yes. Now, can I just say something to all the, all the girls here? Hey, if a strange couple you've never met says to you, hey, would you like to get an Uber and go to a hotel room with us? Your answer is always no. Don't ever do that. But this, this young girl named Bailey says, yes, I will. And so we begin to talk with her a little bit and hear a little bit about her story. And we, we tell her the next morning, hey, listen, if you want to ride back to the airport with us, you can. And in the morning, she gets in the car and my wife says to her, her name's Bailey, Bailey, I think God put us here for you. And Bailey, I've lived what you're living, and I want you to know God sees you, and you're not alone. And Bailey says, I so need to hear that because my brother lost a battle to drug addiction, and I've been wondering if God even knows where I'm at in this world. And I've been asking him for a sign, and I think you guys were my sign that God sees me. Christy and Bailey exchanged phone numbers and social media uh, names and kind of kept up with each other. Two days later, two days later, after this encounter, Bailey posts on her social media a Bible verse. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I may never have another God moment in my life, but in that moment, because we were listening to what the Spirit said, God, just show us. We're delayed. You've got a reason for it. God, is there something you want us to do? And we see this young girl. Listen, a destiny's changed. And I'm saying to you, the more you live your life moment by moment, saying, God, fill me. God, everything about my life is under your command. God, show me. God will begin to empower your life and your work, and a pure and a surrendered life becomes an empowered life to drive out the darkness and bring God's kingdom. You're invited to that. But that ain't church. That ain't believing in God. That's surrendering moment by moment whatever you do to him. And then he invites you, finally, to follow Jesus and living your life on a mission. So I'm getting my identity and my validity from, from God, and I'm living my life day by day, moment by moment, filled with, led by, then empowered by the Spirit. And I want to follow Jesus and living my life on mission. Jesus returns from the wilderness, and he intentionally stepped into his mission. Luke 4, 16 says he went to the synagogue, and he read, as was his custom, which means this is what he did all the time, which means that we ought to go to church too. If Jesus did it, we ought to be engaged in, in, a, in a local body regularly. And on this particular day, he was handed the Isaiah scroll, and the Bible says he found Isaiah 61. It wasn't handed to him and say, hey, read this. Jesus gets the scroll of Isaiah, and he turns to Isaiah 61 intentionally to read this word. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The Bible says he closed the book and everybody is like, dude, what's up? They're looking at him, waiting on what he's about to say. And Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let me translate that. Jesus says... I'm stepping into my identity. I'm the Messiah. I'm the fulfillment of that scripture. Jesus says, I'm here to live my life under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I will live my life filled with, led by, thus empowered by the Holy Spirit from God the Father. And the next few chapters describe how Jesus begins to live his life on mission, casting out demons, releasing the captives, healing disease and sickness, freeing the oppressed, giving sight to the blind preaching and teaching the, the gospel of the kingdom, declaring the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus is living his life on mission. Now hear me, Liberty Combo. God's speaking to you, and the invitation to you is wherever God's going to take you, follow him. Live your life on mission, even as Christ did. Learn from Christ, then carry on his mission.
Not go to church, not just believe in me, not be a good person or invite God to bless your life. That ain't it. But live his mission. You bring the kingdom of God to hurting people all around you. The kingdom of God that is over all of us is now the kingdom of God that resides within us. We're surrendered to him, but please hear me. The kingdom of God that is over us and in us, God wants to bring through us. Can you receive that? I mean, like literally, let me just quit preaching for a second. Can I just say, can you receive that? That God wants you to bring his kingdom in your dorm room. He wants you to bring it on your hall. He wants you to bring it in your classes, with your family, in your community. Wherever you go, he wants you to be a conduit for the kingdom of God to come, to flow right through you. Doesn't matter what you do vocationally, God wants his power to flow through you and to see his kingdom come. And my experience is a lot of times that's not this spectacular thing where thousands of people go, oh my God, you're amazing. My experience is a lot of times these God moments are unseen by anybody else, but they're life-changing for the people you encounter. I was in Wyoming this past summer. I try to go to the mountains and get away at least once a year to just be still and not preach, not speak, not lead, not do anything, just be with God. And hear God say he loves me even if I don't do anything for him. To just sit and say, God, I, I need you to speak into my life. And so I'm doing that first day. I get in late on a Tuesday night. And so the next morning I get up, want to take a shower, and the water won't work. And the, the manager of the, the property said, hey, listen, there's been some issues with the washing machine. And so I'm just assuming that, you know, they turned the water off to the washing machine. It was right by the shower. So maybe they forgot to turn it on. So I called them and said, hey, can y'all send somebody over? Get the shower working. So they said, yeah, somebody will be there in a little bit. So I go sit down on the couch. And then I open up the scripture to what I'm teaching you today. Luke chapters 3, 4, and 5. And then God just begins to download and impart to me this whole idea about Chip getting your, get your identity and your validity from me. You, you get that straight out of me. And Chip, and Chip, I want you to live your life filled with, led by, and empowered by the Holy Spirit and live your life on mission. I'm like, boom, God, I got that. I'm down. Here we go. Let's roll. Knock on the door. The repairman. So I jump up from the couch and I run to the door, open up the door, and there's this frumpy dude named Calvin. He's the repairman. Calvin ain't shaved in a while. Calvin didn't look like he had slept in a while. And he said, I'm Calvin. I'm here to fix the shower. He said, come on in. Calvin's right in here. I'm sure they left the water off, blah, blah, blah. Calvin turns the shower one way, turns the water the other way, pulls it out a little bit, and water just starts to flow out of the faucet. All right, y'all, I'm freaking, I'm embarrassed. I'm a preacher. I can't fix nothing, but I at least know how to turn the water on in the shower. And yet, I'd done everything he did and nothing happened, and yet water is now flowing out. And I'm like, Calvin, man, dude, I don't know what to tell you. I'm embarrassed. I tried everything and nothing happened. Dude, I'm sorry you had to come out. No problem. I, I showed him out the door, shut the door, went back, flopped down on the couch. Like, all right, Jesus, where were we before we got interrupted? And it was like something inside of me said, what was that? I thought you were supposed to be following me as a spiritual person in a broken world, to be filled and led and empowered. But when Calvin came to your door, it's like, Chip, it's like you left Jesus on the couch. And you went and engaged Calvin, but you didn't take me with you. You didn't go as a light in the darkness. And so I had to just confess, honestly, guys, I had to confess, God, I missed it. I so screwed that up. And I felt like the Spirit was just nudging me. It's been three or four minutes since Calvin had left. I felt like the Spirit was nudging me and saying, what if this whole thing wasn't about your shower? What if the whole thing was about Calvin and his life? And I noticed that his shoulders had been slumped, like he had this weight on him, and I could see it in his countenance. And so I jumped up from the couch, and I ran to the door thinking Calvin was probably driving off in his service truck, like I was going to have to yell at him. And I opened up the door, and Calvin's standing there looking at his phone. I'm like, Calvin, what's up? Bro, you're here. You're here. He's like, yeah, man, here I am. I said, Calvin, are you weighed down by anything? Man, I just, is, are you carrying like a burden? He said, yeah. He said, this is the worst day of my life. He recounted how a girl had hurt him and done him wrong. He'd been in jail. He'd been overworked and just ready to give up on life. I said, Calvin, I don't think you came to this condo to fix my shower. I think God brought you here because God has a word for you. I said, Calvin, before you got here, I was reading in Isaiah 61 and in Luke chapter 4 about how Jesus came to meet people like you. And he said, well, listen, man, I'm giving up on God and all of my problems. I'm, I'm just giving up. I said, no, 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 man. I think God brought you here for me to tell you he's not giving up on you. 
And he said, well, God needs to send me a, a girl because all these dating apps want to charge $20 a month to talk to them. <laughs> like, <laughs> Calvin, ain't no girl going to solve what you got going on on the inside. Right? Nobody can, can fill that need. He said, I'm empty. He said, I'm always last, and I never get ahead. You ever felt that way? I never get ahead. I'm always last. I said, Calvin, any chance you would let me read Isaiah 61 to you? I said, I swear I'll pay you. If you'll just stand here, I will pay you to let me read the word of God to you. And he said, no, man, go ahead. And so I, I read Isaiah 61, and I said, Calvin, when Jesus came to the earth, he read this very scripture and he said, I came to fulfill this. I came to fill up broken people and to heal broken people and to set captives free and to give people life. I said, Calvin, do you ever have a relationship? Have you ever had a relationship with Jesus? He said, well, no, but I've always wanted to. I believe in him. But I don't have a relationship with him. I said, Cal Calvin, I think Jesus wants to come into your life and to forgive you and make you alive and fill you up and turn you around. I said, Calvin, do you want that? He said, yes, I do. And that day, in complete obscurity, nobody out there on this little patio but me and Calvin, Calvin went from death to life, from empty to full, from giving up to going on. I gave him some information about some local churches and our church and how to start growing in his faith. And we parted ways and I closed the door and I just said, God, thank you. I want to live my life like that every day. As a son, filled with, led by, and watching you supernaturally show up in everyday encounters so that your kingdom comes. I want to live on mission to bring your kingdom to earth. I don't ever want to leave you on the couch again. And so can I say to you today, that's the invitation of Jesus to you. Quit leaving Jesus at Convo. Quit leaving him at Convo. And you step into your identity as a child of God, a son or a daughter. You accept this invitation, not just say, I'm going to go to heaven one day, but you step into this unbelievable invitation to say every day you could be filled with, led by, and supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And you live your life on mission, and you bring the kingdom of God right here, wherever you go. We're about to close in prayer, and we're going to sing a song of worship, but could I invite you, would you just say yes to his invitation right now? Come on across the room if you're watching online. Would you just pray right now? Jesus is offering you this invitation. Would you turn from everything in this world and turn from yourself and receive your identity in him? Would you say yes to Jesus by faith? Would you accept his love and his acceptance and his approval? Come on, just say yes. Would you accept his invitation to be filled with, led by, and empowered every day? Every day by God. God, my life belongs to you. I surrender everything to you moment by moment. Spirit of God, fill me, lead me, show me, use me. And would you say to God, God, would you just let my life be lived on mission for your glory every single day? Lord, I want to be a kingdom bringer. I want to be a light in this dark world. Not for my glory but for yours. Jesus, would you hear us say yes? Yes, we surrender everything to you. And we start now saying, God, we worship you. We will live our lives from this place, from this day forward. God, work with us. Salvation is a miracle of a moment. Sanctification is a journey of a lifetime. But God, day by day, moment by moment, we say yes for your glory in the name of Christ. Amen.
Hey guys, can you just uh, help me thank Chip Henderson for being here today and blessing us? You know, I want to thank him. On Sunday afternoon, I texted him and asked him if he would come and speak today. We had originally had Sarah Huckabee Sanders scheduled to be here, but we invited her a year ago to come and to be here. And in the meantime, between that day and this day, she announced her uh, campaign to run for governor of Arkansas because of campaign laws. We couldn't actually bring her to speak. And so I texted him on Sunday afternoon, and Chip said, absolutely, I'll be there. It might have had something to do with his son being here, but regardless, he wanted to come and open that word for you today. But listen, tonight, campus community, 7 o'clock, Al Holly is going to be speaking tonight. Now, Al Holly, in case you don't know who he is, he's on our faculty here at Liberty. He heads up our urban ministry, the School of Divinity. He also uh, has headed up Urban Inspire. He was the Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, representative in Atlanta. He also played for the Alabama Crimson Tide football team. And he is going to be here tonight, open God's word, a powerful, powerful word. So make sure you come back tonight, 7 o'clock, and be here for that. We'll see you then. God bless.